Hello, my name is Alicia Bannon and I direct the Judiciary Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. I'm delighted to be here today with Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez of the Washington Supreme Court. Chief Justice Gonzalez has served as a justice on Washington State's highest court for the past decade and as the Chief Justice since January of 2021. Chief Justice Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I'd like to start us off with a question about state constitutions. I think when most people think about constitutions, they think about our federal constitution. And I would love to hear from you what you see as the role of the Washington Supreme Court and the Washington state constitution in protecting rights. Now, thank you for that question. Uh, in law school, we were mostly taught about the federal system and less so about the state system. Uh, and of course, the lens is completely different. And in a review of a federal court action by the government, the question is, what gives them the authority to do something? And if there isn't explicit authority to do it, it can't be done. In states, it's the opposite. States can do anything unless they're prohibited from doing so. So the question is a different question that we ask on review for state court questions than the federal questions. And the job of the state Supreme Court is to question whether authority has been exercised under law. That is, if the government has done something, uh, were they allowed to do it and did they do it right? Uh, the Constitution in our state is more protective in some respects than the federal Constitution. For example, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence under our Article I, Section 7 provides more protection than the federal Constitution does. So our job is to make sure that we are interpreting that Constitution to be protective of those individual rights that were identified uh, in our state Constitution. We also have a quasi-legislative function in passing court rules and a quasi-executive function in running the judicial branch and convening important discussions, which we often do through our boards and our commissions. Uh, so the, the state judiciary has an important role as uh, a co-equal branch of government uh, here at the state level in protecting those rights enshrined in our state constitution. And you, you mentioned how the Fourth Amendment under Washington's constitution is different than the federal constitution. What, what are some of the considerations as a, as a judge that you take when you, when you are taking a different approach to constitutional interpretation than the federal courts have taken to similar provisions under um, the federal constitution? Sure. First, we have to do a comparative analysis of the text itself. Uh, and of course, our constitution was not passed at the same time that the federal constitution or even the Bill of Rights was passed. So there's a different historical backdrop uh, and political backdrop to it as well. So we, we are informed by what the federal interpretations have been of similar language, but not controlled by it. So we have to look at our own state's uh, unique position. And the language is, in fact, different here. Uh, the government shall not uh, interfere with one's private affairs. So there is an explicit privacy right in Washington. And it's led to results, for example, uh, that differ from federal law in the driving under the influence context, where under federal law, you can have a general roadblock where you stop everyone and check them to see whether they're under the influence. Under Washington law, there has to be a particularized suspicion of the individual before you can interfere with their private affairs. So such a roadblock is unconstitutional uh, under state law, even though it's allowed under federal law. I'd like to turn to hear a little bit about how you think about judging. So Chief Justice John Roberts of the US Supreme Court famously compared judging to calling balls and strikes, and it's a term that's really stuck. Can you give us your personal version of balls and strikes, a metaphor, a phrase, or maybe a case that distills how you think about judging, what your approach is? Well, it's a fascinating question. I, I've never been a big fan of using sports metaphors to describe sports. It, it sort of leaves some folks out who are, aren't maybe uh, involved in the details. But if we're going to work with that metaphor, I think it's incomplete because we are not just calling balls and strikes, we're actually defining what the strike zone is in some instances. And that's different than this idea that it's a mathematical formula that we're applying. There's a great deal of discretion in deciding what that zone is gonna be in the first instance. And so we're, we're often doing that. Um, you know, the, the idea that we have to require ourselves uh, to put ourselves in the shoes of our founding fathers to decide what the law is today uh, seems overly strained to me. But let's take a quote from one, in, one of the founding fathers because they weren't all of a mind 
about what judicial review would look like. And, and this one is from uh, Thomas Jefferson, who didn't get everything right, but I think he got this one right. Uh, he said that, quote, I'm not an advocate for frequent changes in laws and constitutions, but laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. And as that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, and manners and opinions change, with the change in, of circumstances, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. He concluded by saying, we might as well require somebody to wear still the coat which fitted them as a child, as civilized society to remain ever under the regimen of our barbarous ancestors. So what I think Thomas Jefferson was saying is that those things that we do today that might seem reasonable in retrospect in the future will seem barbarous. And indeed, the denial of humanhood to uh, many people in our nation, the denial of uh, suffrage and other rights to women, et cetera, those things now uh, are barbarous in retrospect. And some of the things we're doing today may well be as well. And so I think the purpose for me of our work is to decide what the principles were and to give effect to those to the soaring rhetoric that we're all entitled to uh, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. What does that mean today and how do we interpret it? I, I think that's the, the job. There must be some elasticity uh, in those words. That's a, that's a fascinating quote. So speaking of our, our constitutional framers or our founding fathers, as some people call them, you know, they've taken on quite an outsized role in the U.S. Supreme Court's approach to constitutional interpretation of late. And I would love to hear your, your reflections on the Supreme Court's embrace of originalism as an approach to constitutional interpretation and how you think about originalism with respect to your own judicial philosophy. Yeah. Uh... Again, I, I don't think that originalism is elastic enough. I don't think it's flexible um, enough. And it really can do violence to someone if you require them to imagine themselves to be a slave owner who didn't believe women had equal rights in order to understand what the Constitution means. And I, I don't think that's what the framers uh, intended. Uh, I, I think it has to be more complicated than that. I also don't believe that we're untethered from those words. The words and their interpretation matter how they've been interpreted in the past matter a great deal. Uh, I just think that we need to be careful when we're trying to find that intent. It's, it's like the work that we do to determine legislative intent when we're interpreting a statute for the first time. Uh, we try to imagine what the legislature meant, but that's hundreds of people who didn't agree with each other. So legislative intent is a bit of a construct. It's a myth, it doesn't necessarily exist. The idea is, what do the people need from these words? What was the, the policy and intent uh, of it? So looking at the big picture and understanding what rights are being protected and why is critical in, in that analysis. It, it isn't simply what, what would uh, the founding father have done in this instance, because frankly, there isn't just one of them ever. That's, that is well put. I want to shift gears and turn to a statement that the Washington Supreme Court issued back in June 2020 that I, I thought was just really remarkable. It was a statement about racial injustice in our legal system. So the, the court said, and I quote, as judges, we must recognize the role we have played in devaluing Black lives. And it is only by carefully reflecting on our actions, taking individual responsibility for them, and constantly striving for better that we can address the shameful legacy we inherit. And I wanted to ask you, looking back more than two years later, to, to what extent do you think the court has taken up that call to action and, and what work remains to be done? Well, I wanna take a moment and give uh, some credit here. Uh, Justice Stevens was chief at the time uh, and she proposed that we issue a statement after the George Floyd uh, killing. And Justice Mary Yu, uh, who co-chairs our Minority and Justice Commission, uh, helped with the drafting of that letter. And I have to confess that initially when the idea was floated, I was skeptical that as a court, we could say something meaningful and actually live up to it. I was really pleased that in fact, we came up with strong language and we've been striving to live up to those ideals. So my, my skepticism about it was incorrect. My colleagues were right. And I'm just so glad that the court issued that statement. But the work didn't start with the letter. 
I think it's a point in time along a continuum, recognizing the work that we've been doing, rededicating ourselves to working harder toward it, and more importantly, making a public statement that we value this. We recognize that this is the context in which we're doing our work and calling on other members of the judicial branch and those who support it to uh, do the same thing, to evaluate how they're doing their work and why. Uh, some of the things that we've done that I think help us live up to this uh, rhetoric in the letter is passing of the general rule 37, which created an objective observer standard for jury selection, and more importantly, the removal of jurors for no reason uh, whatsoever, because the Batson uh, rule under the Batson versus Kentucky uh, case wasn't uh, working to eliminate racial bias uh, in the exclusion of people of color from sitting and hearing cases. So we, we extended uh, that rule to make, to make it much clearer that you can't remove uh, people of color so easily with, without uh, uh, scrutiny from the court. That objective observer standard, I think, has been uh, critical, and it's uh, expanded into other areas of law for us in the state. And other states have taken up uh, that similar rule to ours. It was the first in the nation uh, that said, uh, if you try to strike a juror, if an objective observer defined as somebody who's aware of the history of racism and implicit bias, if they could, not would, if they could conclude that race was a factor in the removal of that juror, that juror may not be removed. That is a sea change uh, in the way we address implicit bias and bias uh, in our system. Because if you're biased intentionally or unintentionally, the result is the same on the person who's being discriminated against. And so we're trying actually to eliminate that effect uh, in jury selection. But we've done so much more. We amended our uh, rule of professional conduct 8.4 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. Uh, we have done a global review of all of our rules and removed biased, gendered, and non-inclusive language in those rules, many of which were passed years ago. We adopted a rule, a general rule 39, to make it easier for people to reduce or even eliminate their legal financial obligations. We amended a comment to our rules of professional conduct 4.4 to make it clear that it's a violation of the, those rules to use someone's immigration status as leverage against them uh, in a case. Uh, we've limited the uh, effectuation of immigration arrest warrants, which are civil at or near our courthouses. Uh, through case law, State v. Jackson, we prohibited a blanket shackling policy uh, that was being used in a court in, in our state. We have repudiated biased language in prior opinions. Uh, even if the rule of law might be right, we uh, disavowed the language that was used to get there. In a, a case, Mancini versus the city of Tacoma, we held that police have a duty of care when executing warrants. Uh, giving more uh, of the public an ability to uh, object well, when things haven't gone well. Uh, in State v. Blake, we found that simple drug possession, uh, the statute in our state was unconstitutional because it had no mens rea element. The state didn't have to prove knowledge or intent, uh, which undid hundreds, if not thousands, of convictions for simple possession um, of drugs, which had a disproportionate effect on people of color and those living in poverty. Uh, in State versus Zamora, we reversed a case where the prosecutor repeatedly appealed to bias, uh, anti-immigrant bias, in a case with a Latino defendant who was not himself even an immigrant. Uh, and we found that that uh, couldn't go through the harmless error analysis, that that was just antithetical to the idea of a just system. We posthumously vacated a conviction against Alec Tausnut for fishing on traditional tribal waters. Uh, again, an opinion that had uh, abusive and uh, racist language about Native Americans uh, that we needed to repudiate. Uh, we granted diploma privilege during the pandemic to allow people to uh, practice law and not be in close proximity, uh, giving them the risk of uh, transmission of the disease. Uh, our boards and commissions are doing great work, including on language access uh, and other issues. And so th there's much that we're doing, and we take seriously our commitment to live up to the rhetoric in that letter. And what has been most challenging with respect to living up to that rhetoric? Like, would there is there an area you would point to where you see there's there's more work that needs to be done? There's a substantial amount of work 
uh, that still needs to be done. And, and I think the difficulty in it is that as a profession, we're fairly conservative. We're trained, we're taught for three years and then years after that in, in practice to be backward looking. And so we're, we're stumbling forward, walking backwards, looking back at where we've been trying to predict what we might trip over next. And we can't possibly predict the trunk or the vine that's gonna trip us up that way. I think occasionally we have to look over our shoulder or even turn around and see what we're facing. So resisting our natural te temptation to say, oh, we can't do that. That's outside of our, of our realm, I, I think is hard work. I remember it came up when I was a trial court judge and uh, I and a couple of my colleagues proposed a rule uh, to prohibit ICE from arresting people in or around our courthouses because we wanted everyone to feel uh, liberty to come to court and adjudicate their disputes peacefully uh, without the specter of federal enforcement. And, and some of my colleagues on the trial bench said, well, we can't do that. That's a political question. But just because immigration status has been politicized, it doesn't mean access to justice is political. Uh, and so eventually we did pass it and Homeland Security agreed to honor uh, that policy, uh, at least until the most recent administration before the current one, uh, who went back on that deal. But we, we again have their agreement to respect that policy. So I think it's important for courts to be a bit courageous on issues like that and say, our job is to provide a forum for people to resolve their disputes. Therefore, uh, it's problematic for us to be enmeshed with and involved in immigration enforcement because it will mean witnesses won't come, victims won't come, parents won't come to support their kids in juvenile court. Uh, and so as a policy matter, that that is an access to justice issue well within our wheelhouse. So thinking through those kinds of issues are, are the big challenges. Uh, it takes bravery, courage, dedication, and a great deal of patience uh, to move something like the judicial branch. Can you tell us why you became a state Supreme Court justice and a little bit about the path that you took to the bench? Well, I'm uh, uh, the first in my family to go to college, let alone law school. And so um, this is not where I expected to be when I was a kid. It is not where my counselors expected me to be when I was a kid. Uh, but I, I went to school to college because I thought uh, that I wanted to have more options and chances. And once I got there, I, I loved education for its own sake. Uh, I became an Asian studies, an East Asian studies major. I lived in China and Japan. Uh, I went back as a graduate student to Japan and then eventually law school. Uh, I practiced in private practice, uh, was recruited away to uh, litigation in, in criminal cases. I did uh, domestic violence work, and then I worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office, where I prosecuted hate crimes and child prostitution and international terrorism cases. Um, and I was recruited to put my name in for the bench. Um, and I had been encouraging others to pursue such a career. And so I felt if I didn't do it myself, I, I would be hypocritical uh, to urge others to take leadership, but not do it myself. And so I, I sought an appointment from the governor and got one 21 years ago now in Superior Court and saw the difference that one can make uh, on the bench, both on the cases and during the administration of the uh, court system itself, uh, and as a role model, because there were too few role models of color. And I, I really wanted to change the image of what a judge looks like and give kids of color a hope that they uh, have a role model too to aspire to, and to have the majority culture also change their view of what a judge looks like. And I think it's more than just appearance, it is substance. Uh, the studies all show that a heterogeneous body is better than a homogeneous one. Many of them uh, in jury deliberations show that uh, a mixed jury is better on every objective measure than a homogeneous jury is except maybe on the measure of efficiency. If you're gonna do it better, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So I think that sacrifice and efficiency is well worth it uh, because we found that mixed juries, for example, were more likely to talk amongst themselves. They were more likely to actually read and follow the instructions from the court. They were more likely to examine carefully the exhibits that were given to them. And I think that's true for us too, as a uh, court of last review, there are nine of us, and that diversity among us helps us, I think, be uh, better uh, decision makers, and the outcomes are different and improved. Um, 
so those are some of the reasons about why I chose to put my name in. And after serving 10 years as a trial court judge, I was pushed and encouraged to apply for the Supreme Court, uh, an opening that was coming up. And again, did some soul searching and decided that I couldn't uh, not do it because I had long been saying that I, I might get rejected, but I don't want to reject myself and others. You may be rejected, but let them reject you. Don't do it. Don't do it for them. They may well surprise you uh, and give you the chance to, to show what you have. How have your own life experiences, professional experiences impacted your work as a judge and your deliberations with colleagues? And maybe on the other side, how have some of your colleagues' experiences impact how you've thought about the law? Yeah, oh, that's that's a great question. Um, I remember being on the campaign trail uh, when I was first running because we're elected in our state. Uh, the governor gets to a point to an interim vacancy, but you have to stand immediately for election. And one of the questions I was asked in different forms more than once across the state was, do you think you can be fair and impartial if the litigant before you is also Latino? And that says a whole lot about both me and the person asking the question because uh, people from the majority were not asked a similar question. They weren't asked if a white person is in front of you, can you be fair? And that's because I think we often make this mistake of thinking the norm is the neutral. And I'm not the norm, and so the assumption is I'm not neutral and I'll be biased in favor of maybe my own demographic. Well, first of all, my own demographic is a bit more complicated than just Latino. Uh, so assumptions are built into the very question itself. Um, and second, the, the idea that um, this is a different question and appropriate for me and not for the majority culture just points out how we view neutrality. Uh, it's partly the work that we've done on uh, redefining what an objective observer is. We're saying that objective observer includes all of our experiences, not just the majority experience. And it's important to have people making decisions who have a variety of experiences, who may have lived in poverty themselves, who may have experienced life as a person of color or as a gay person, uh, and understand what uh, that, that is like as well and bring that experience. I've also found that uh, it's not just a different voice in the room, but the majority voice changes when I'm in the room as well. So I think it changes the very nature of the discussion. I think it makes us better and uh, requires us to go back to uh, founding principles and think about why we're doing what we're doing and why we've always done uh, what we're doing. Uh, I'm a big fan of that sort of inclusiveness and I, I think it makes us better uh, overall. Uh, I have talked about my own experiences growing up. Uh, and I, you know, I've been a prosecutor, so I've worked closely with law enforcement, but I've also had negative interactions with them as a, as a young man of color uh, being stopped for reasons that I thought were inappropriate. I think that's an important perspective to have on the bench. We shouldn't assume uh, that every single time a stop happened that it was legitimate. We should also understand that many of them are. Uh, and I, I think that perspective uh, matters. Chief Justice Gonzalez, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We're, we're really grateful for your, your participation and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to speak with you.